Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, to give this talk. And um, so if it's too loud, like background noise, we have a bit of storms here in Switzerland, but um, just let me know in case something is, is wrong. So this is about uh, our recent paper about on the misuse of color in science communication that we published in Nature Communications and it got a lot of uh, traction uh, online, like on social media, but also it was accessed a lot of times already. Um, it's about, you know, broadly speaking, scientific visualization, which is, which is key for um, science in general, because this is how we communicate mostly. And uh, so also this work was, was done in collaboration with my colleagues, Grace Shepard, also from SEED in Oslo, and Phil Heron from Durham University. And all the details about this talk you also find on my webpage. Um, and if you follow us on Twitter, um, you get all kinds of discussions um, of experts from different backgrounds in graphic design and also from scientists. So I, I suggest you do that. Okay, so to start, um, I just want you to show these uh, quite uh, motivating panels. Um, for example, the left one on the bottom, good design can't be unseen, good science won't be seen without good design, uh, which is very true. Um, this visual language is very important because it kind of spans generations and cultures and tends also the recent rise in emojis, right? You can communicate to anybody um, via visual um, images. And then in science every day, it has become a competition for people's attention. There are so many papers and people just basically uh, look at the title and then maybe just quickly scan through the figures. And if they don't like it, or if they don't get the point immediately, they won't read the paper. So visualization is very important. And it's indeed the one thing that basically the draws, draws the scientific viewer. So um, when we communicate something, we often draw, right, to just make it more clear. And this is what the shark is saying here. So visualization is important. Um, visualization is also one of the most widely used scientific methodologies in science. Um, but who of you got some education in visualization? I went through you know, years of studies at ETH in Zurich, one of the leading universities, but never had one single visualization class, which is kind of surprising given that it's a, a scientific methodology we all use so much. So what you could have learned in, in, in classes like this is um, to create like a graphics like this one here, and then think about um, how it appears to people. And a common thing to do for, for graphics designers to think of, uh, of the highway billboard test, which is basically matching it on a billboard on a, on a highway and the people driving by have, have only about five seconds to look at it, which is you know, the average time we spend looking on figures usually. So if you don't immediately, immediately get the point, you know, we miss um, the content. So it's important to make this all graphics as clear as possible and uh, as visually captivizing as possible. Uh, for this, we need to know our visualization tools and there are a few and important ones. And for example, the first one is images, like photography. Um, it's important that they are in high quality if we show them. Um, it's important that they are relevant to your data. And for us, especially, it's important that, you know, we need to think about the copyright. So people um, also spend time and work effort into these images. So we need to cite them. Um, a good web page with open source um, images is Pixabay, and there are several different ones as well. So I suggest you just get your images from there if you look for a like a standard image. Then another tool uh, is um, fonts. And this is quite important because we often neglect fonts. 
Um, here are quite extreme examples of different fonts that kind of um, communicate emotions. So quiet, loud, fun, serious, happy, and scary. Um, you know, you find open fonts, um, that more types of fonts that go beyond the system defaults um, on, for example, the Google font. Um, this can become also very important for us as scientists because um, so these two texts appear quite differently, even though they have the same text. Um, so for example, here you see the comparison between a serif font and a sans serif font. Um, and it's important to know what uh, medium you show your text. So whether it's online, through a screen, or whether it's in print, but it all matters. And the most important part about visualization is to you know, prevent the basic pitfalls. And there are a few as well, uh, which need to be known. Um, for example, this guy here, um, Steve Jobs from Apple, um, he also knew about you know, some of these pitfalls and he used them to his advantage. For example, pie charts in 3D. Um, in green is the apple pie. And if you compare it to the, the purple one, uh, you think it's probably a bigger slice, isn't it? But in fact, it's the smaller slice. And, you know, there was no coincidence that Steve Jobs would put apple um, to the bottom and the front facing uh, pie because he knew that humans cannot easily quantify angles. And so this is a very distorting chart, for example, and we shouldn't use them in science. Um, if you want to know about other distorting charts, you go to Fox News, um, for example, bar plots. So there's something really wrong about these because they don't have a zero baseline. And to outline this more clearly, on the left-hand side, you see a similar plot like Fox News showed, um, where you would think interest rates would increase dramatically. But if you plot them correctly, like on, like on the right-hand side, you see that there's basically no change in interest rates over time. So bar plots must have zero baselines. Another recent example by Fox News is um, the daily new cases of COVID uh, back in March last year. And what's wrong with this chart? Right, so the scale is distorted. For example, at the base, they show uh, on the same uh, vertical distance, they show a uh, difference between 30 cases and on top between 50 cases. So that makes the graph look like it, the cases wouldn't increase over time. It looks like a steady, like not that dramatic increase. And then they also, you know, do more stuff like having just a difference of 10 in the middle. And this was just to, you know, make this guy look much lower than it actually is. So you can really distort your data by using certain um, visualization aspects. And it's important that especially figure scales are not to be played with because otherwise you distort your data and the reader cannot see the true nature of the data anymore. So you blindly interpret the data. Um, yeah, for example, a scale like this, you know, imagine you would make a graph with the scale like this, a graph plotted on it, and then you submit it to a, a scientific journal, it would immediately get rejected, right? And your supervisor would, you know, immediately point this out to you, you're wrong, you cannot do that. The reviewers would reject it immediately. So there would be no way to publish this, right? The problem is, it's actually not true. Um, this is the exact representation of the rainbow color map. And uh, yeah, as you know, rainbow color map is everywhere. It's actually one of the most used uh, color maps on present day in science. And as you can see, so for example, where the scale is, is going uh, narrower and narrower, you can see that the difference between the colors much more clear than for example, in the greenish sign part, where you basically don't see the individual steps of colors anymore. So it's a way to distort data and it's commonly accepted. And even if you point it out as a reviewer to the authors or the editors, they commonly just you know, ignore your comment. 
And to understand why this is very important that you don't distort the color map, um, it's important to understand what a color map is or what a color bar is. Um, a color bar can turn a three-dimensional plot into a two-dimensional plot, um, which is very convenient to publish in papers. Uh, so it's basically the color bar is a representation of the of the position axis, like the third dimension axis uh, shown on the left hand side. And the color map is its fundamental property. It's basically the same as the spacing between the ticks and the position axis um, is the change of color between you know, the ticks in the color bar. And as I said before, uh, Chet, we've done some uh, countings uh, in 2018 at EGU and more than 64% of the, all the posters uh, used a rainbow color map to present their data. Um, so yes, this is the rainbow color map represented as a position axis. And I should also say Chet is a, is a version of a rainbow color map just so you don't get confused. And this distortion comes, becomes really clear only if you know the picture up ahead, right? If you know the original version of the picture and then look at the colored image. Uh, for example, here you see an apple, you see Marie Curie, and you see the earth. And they're colored ones in chat, which is the rainbow color map, the unscientific rainbow color map. And on the right-hand side, you see it colored in Batlow which is a scientific, perceptionally uniform, and non-distorting color map. So the distortion is, becomes really clear. And if you, in science, we often don't know how the data looks in advance, right? So we use the colors to get a visual impression of it. And then it suddenly becomes really hard to, for example, if we want to infer the, the bite that was taken out of the apple, it's almost impossible if we just look at it close up. And then also you see all the distortions in Marie Curie's face. And uh, just to illustrate more further, if, if the, the head of uh, Marie Curie is not uh, too familiar with you, there's a more familiar head, which is um, the head of department at the geosciences at the University of Oslo. And in the middle, you see again the original pictures. On the left-hand side, you see again uh, the distorted rainbow uh, picture. And on the right hand side, you see the one in Batlow. And, uh, you know, she looks distorted on the left hand side and flawless on the right hand side. So, color gradients need to be uniform, and they need to be uniform perceptionally, how we perceive it. This is very important. So, how do we do that? Um, to understand how we see color, we need to understand the whole visual apparatus, plus the light source, the colored object, and the object background. Uh, this is shown here. So we have a light source that shines on an object, and it, um, um, it reflects some wavelengths of the light, uh, which we then perceive as color. So this wavelength goes through the eye lines, it hits the cone cells, on the back of our eyes, and then there through the cone cells, um, there are different ones for short, medium, and long wavelength. They are transmitted to the optical nerve and then towards the optical cortex, where we perceive color as such. Um, two important points to point out is that there is no uniform color perception amongst um, all of us. So we all differ a little bit. So we see color all a bit different. And then there are more, more obvious uh, differences between individuals due to physio physiological deviations as well. And I will come to that later on. So anyway, um, to quantify the human visual perception is, is, is not that easy. It's very complicated. So I tried to read myself into all this literature and there's literature back, you know, almost 100 years in time. But there's a lot has been done, and luckily there's now a but. Um, color spaces have been derived already uh, to quantify the human visual perception. So this is good, because then we can put it down in numbers. Um, one of these perceptionally uniform color spaces is, is the CCAM 2 UCS. 
and it describes a certain color by its lightness instead of an RGB space where you have red, green, and, and blue. Um, it represents all the colors in a space uh, depending on its lightness. Uh, it's red and green and yellow and blue correlates. These are some names and you don't need to know about that um, in detail. What you need to know is that from this color space, you can derive a color difference metric, uh, delta E, which allows the calculation of an incremental perceptual color difference along a color gradient. So it, it, it gives you a number of the color difference between two different colors. And this we can use to diagnose color maps. And this is also what I've done and we show in the paper. So here you see again the, the comparison between the scientific Batlow color map with the delta E, the, this measure that has the same color gradient all along the color map because the line is flat. Uh, whereas chat, the rainbow color map, has a huge difference. So it, it shows more gradient um, in some areas and lower gradients in some other. This then leads to the problem that all we see in uh, color maps like chat is the cyan part and the yellow part. These are very um, attracted by our eyes. And this is where usually people would draw, you know, outline their favorite feature in, in the data. Uh, you can also quantify the error introduced by these color maps. So for backlow, the error is almost zero all the way. Uh, through the color map, whereas for the rainbow color map, you know, the biggest error is actually 8.15% for this exact color map, which is a lot if you think about your scientific data and what's the error in it. So it can usually be the biggest error uh, in your uh, research. And then, you know, just to illustrate it further, um, you can represent a linear graph, like a slope, that would be represented by these color maps. So uh, the linear graph in Batlow looks flat, as it should be. The linear graph in rainbow color map would look like this, very bubbly, extremely bubbly, actually. So the distortion is real and it's significant. And this also becomes clear, you know, if you make show the same data but uh, change the, the color bar max and min values which are done here and it's on both sides it's the same data um, on the right hand side with the scientific color map you always see the same structures whereas on the left hand side with the rainbow color map you can basically show what you want so yeah it's almost like you you produce your data depending where you set the color bar minimum and maximum. They're very attracted to the yellow boundary and the sign boundary. So this is where we introduce artificial boundaries to the data. And then, you know, if you go to the internet and for example, want to have a, a plot of the Martian topography, you search Mars topography. All you see is this, it's full of rainbow. And it's actually quite shocking because, you know, it introduces a lot of artificial artifacts. And uh, this rainbow color map here in particular is called the Mola rainbow, um, named after the data set. And it is usually plotted like this, with the same maximum and minimum color bar values and the same color map. Um, and this is the comparison to the scientific version, losing using La Jolla um, from, from my suit of scientific color maps, um, which is intuitively recognizable as Mars, right, as a start. And then it also shows more detail. For example, if you just pick this location here, um, if you look um, in the La Jolla version, you see lots of craters in the middle. If you look in the rainbow version, you see, you know, very, very few craters and all these small wavelength structures are basically hidden. You don't even see them. So people always always say with the rainbow color map you see more, but what you see is just the artifacts. And then in some parts of, of your rainbow color scale, you don't even see the small scale features. Another version 
uh, just to highlight this more, uh, uh, is the moon. So on top again with the rainbow color map, at the bottom again with an intuitive scientific color map. Um, and again, you can see features like craters much more clearly, whereas on top you basically miss all the details. So this is a key color map property, the perceptional uniformity of the color map. Um, but there are other ones. If, if that is not enough for you to, to not use rainbow anymore, there's more. So for example, the color, color vision deficiency friendliness or color blind friendliness. And just to illustrate this again, here again, you see the picture of the head of the department. And some people would see this picture like this. So this is um, a simulation for uh, one, the most common um, color vision deficiency, which is called Deuteranopia. And as you can see, the picture on the left-hand side gets more and more difficult to read, whereas with the scientific color maps, you can still perfectly see it. Um, same for Protanopia, another version, and same for Tritanopia. Some people see it like this, but as you can see, the original and the scientific color map version are always um, readable for all people. And then even in grayscale for totally colorblind people or for when you print papers out in, in black and white, which makes sense, um, you can still read the, the figures, which is key as well. So all the scientific color maps, including Viridis, which is well known, CVDs, which was ex um, especially produced for color vision deficiency. As you can see, it looks almost the same in all the different um, versions of the, uh, of the different uh, simulations for vision. And then Cree, uh, Thermal, and Betlow, they all look fine throughout all the different simulations, whereas Chet is, is hardly readable and even unreadable for some versions because it starts to repeat colors and you know it doesn't become clear anymore whether the high value is the same as the low value and so on. So this is another key color map property, color vision deficiency friendliness. And there's another one, intuitive color order, which is very important. And I tried to highlight this as clearly as possible in this plot where we published um, recently. Um, so if you just have some data points which are picked throughout um, the data range you show with the color bar um, and you want to order them, right? You want to see where are the low values, where are the high values, etc. So you can order that in two ways, basically, intuitively. Um, first one is by color and the second one by lightness. So we go from bright to darker colors. And I, I've done that for you. And as you can see, none of these orders match the actual color, color bar. So you cannot read the data intuitively. Whereas for the scientific battle color map at the bottom, um, there's only one way to, to uh, order them. And this is the right way as it should be. So you can immediately see high values and you can distinguish them from low values. So to summarize, the scientific Betlow color map is perceptionally uniform, rainbow is not. Uh, Betlow is perceptionally ordered, rainbow is not. Betlow is color vision deficiency friendly, rainbow is not. Betlow is readable in black and white, rainbow is not. Hence, Betlow is the scientific and rainbow is the unscientific color map. So we can, I guess, scrap it now because we are scientists and we want to communicate the data without distortion as intuitively as possible and to as many readers as possible. I guess you would all agree to that. Okay, then there's one more um, point I want to outline to you today, which is the availability, since we now want to use scientific color maps. Um, as I mentioned before, I have produced the scientific color maps and there's now version seven coming out next week. Um, and they have all the key um, properties of color maps. And plus it's a complete suite of color map types and classes. And it's fully citable and it's freely available. And this is how they look like currently. 
So on top you see Betlo, which I've shown you a couple of times, but there are many more of the same version. So if you if you want to have a different color uh, scheme, you can choose a different color scheme. And you can see the different types, um, which I will go into detail uh, in a second. So how do you use scientific color maps? Um, there's different classes. So there's the sequential class, like Betlo. And this is done uh, for or used for sequential data. And um, that's the most common use uh, we have to, we usually color uh, data. So this usually it just goes from low to high values. Like for example, the depth here indicated. Um, then there's the diverging class, which um, should be applied to uh, zero center data, like some anomalies, like temperature anomaly, so that you can clearly um, distinguish the, the cold temperatures from the hot temperatures, and you see where it's zero, where the center is. So this is very, very useful way to show this zero center data. And then there's the multi-sequential um, class. And this you use for kind of exceptional data like surface topography, including bathymetry, um, where you have a, a C level that you want to clearly point out, but you show the data uh, simultaneously. So this is a picture of surface topography as you maybe have never seen it before. It, 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 uh, it weights surface topography and bathymetry the same way. Usually surface topography is extremely much more uh, um, weighted than uh, bathymetry. So on all the maps you basically look at, um, mountains on, on the continents look much more higher than in comparison to the, to the um, deep sea trenches. And for an earth scientist, this is quite crucial to get this picture right, isn't it? And then the last class um, there is, it's cyclic. And this is, can, is very useful for circular data like angles. If you show angles, you know, they don't have a, a, an end or a starting value. Or um, as shown here, um, a map for the surface displacement and in in our data and similar ones. Um, so this is continuous types. And then to complicate things, there is also discrete types of color maps, uh, which is shown here, which is basically just um, taking the continuous map and put it into uh, like 10 different discrete color values. This is um, useful if you want to clearly highlight the different values um, in different regions of your plot. Um, and you can use that if, you, if you're not um, interested in the very fine details of your data. And then there's another type, the categorical color maps, like Betlow S. And for this, I, I have made a, a little movie just to outline how I produce them and how they can be used. So I take the Betlow color map, that is uh, the continuous one, and pick the different colors in a way that how many different colors you need to use, they always have the maximum color contrast between them. So they're easily recognizable. And I pick up to 100 um, discrete colors from these color maps. And then you can use them for, for example, line plots like these and have enough line colors to distinguish them all. Um, they are all color vision deficiency friendly readable in black and white, and um, yeah, just scientific. So these are the categorical color maps, which are very useful. Um, and then, you know, you can more effectively apply color maps in general, if you follow some rules. And for this, we in the paper or on my web page, you find this very useful flow chart where you just can go through and given on your data set, find the color map type and class, if you're unsure which one to use. And this color chart goes even further. Um, it also shows you how to choose certain color combinations. So whether you want the dark part on the end of the color map, in the middle, etc. So this clearly outlines um, how you most effectively show the data. Because 
For example, the background color also matters a lot. And this is now outlined on this slide here. Um, as you can all already see, you know, the color of the background uh, word and the color of the color word seem to be different, although it's the same color and it's just due to the background. And we've also in the supplementary of our paper, um, I suggest you go look at the full movie. Um, my design student, Stefan Scherer, has produced this amazing movie that kind of blows your mind. And I'll just show you a little, um, um, little extract, extraction from that. So here you see in the middle this bar, it appears like it's different colors, but it's all one and the same color. And this matters for plots, right? If you have plots with different colors um, that are next to different colors, they might appear different. Um, so again, this is version seven and all these color maps are now available for tons of software visualization programs, even though all of them have different formats for, for some reason. But if you download my package, you, you have instructions in the user guide how to easily import them into most of these programs. So they're easily usable, even if they are not yet built into your favorite software. And they are built into some software, which is great. Um, for example, Staglab, um, GMT version six and later Topo tool, Toolbox, that might have, some of you have heard. Um, submachine and geoscience analyst also, and more coming uh, as time continues. And then I want to thank all the contributors uh, to these scientific color maps, which have been a lot, and they all helped me to, you know, produce the right formats and test them. Um, and also those people that just uh, use and promote the scientific color maps, which is very valuable. So we, th thanks to all this community effort, we have come a long way. Um, we've recently published this paper, The Misuse of Color in Science Communications, which has um, received a lot of traction. And in fact, just today, it reached 70,000 um, accesses just after three months. So it's, it's I think, a huge uh, success, and I hope it will, it will create some change from here on. Um, we have reached other successes, for example, the generic mapping tools, as I mentioned before, version 6.0 and later, have now built in scientific color maps. The IPCC report even um, uses scientific color maps um, for specific data sets and tells their authors to use them for the specific data sets. So they have different color palettes for different data sets and are enforcing it. And then Nature Communications um, has made the great step to, to uh, add more information about the use of colors to authors' uh, guidelines. But then what about all the other software that still uses Rainbow as default? What about the other scientific journals that you know, don't suggest anything about colors to their um, authors? And what about conference organizations? Should they put in a word as well. And what, what about you? Are you still using Rainbow? So um, I also want to thank the early adopters because in the beginning, it's always hard to use it because you face so much um, criticism and uh, negativity. So um, I really think they are pioneers and rebels and indeed awesomeians. Um, just to highlight a few of them, uh, Tulo, Agrusta, Solverino and Kolobek, Straum et al. So they basically showed you for the first time um, the oceanic lithospheric age in a non-rainbow color map. And if you want to go in and look for features that have been hidden so far, you can do that in his paper. Uh, Foley, Van Zelst, Albano, and Orosei are just a few examples of the people that already use it and make use of it. And still, I think we are not there yet. So we, we still have some things to do. Um, unscientific color maps like rainbow are still very common in the science community. And the problem is that the widespread use of rainbow is apparently the number one reason why it's still used so much. So if you have a software that 
default color map is rainbow, you use it. If you have a, a group leader, you know, telling the students to use rainbow, or if he has or she used the color map before, they would use the same ones. So it's important that you keep um, teaching people and keep expressing it to people. So please help us spread the word from here on. Um, lead by example and use the scientific color maps. Let your peers know and say no to rainbow in, in for example, reviews. And if you want to have the right answers to the most frequently asked questions, um, you find on my web page, you find a frequently asked question section where you can get the right answers. And then remind yourself and others constantly about this problem. And we have created also as part of our paper, and you can also find that on my web page, um, a poster that you can put in your coffee room. And so you just have this constant reminder also for new students um, to know that, you know, we have to take care of, of visualization. But here's the real solution. I think visualization, given that it's the fundamental science method should be taught at university level or even before. And it's not, not so far. So I think that's beyond my capabilities, but if you have an opportunity to speak up somewhere to make this happen, please do. So thank you very much for your attention and feel free to follow us on Twitter and look things up in the paper and on my webpage.